Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Christina Crow podcast. I'm your host, psychotherapist Christina Crow. On this show, we love making invisible things visible, and this might truly be the most invisible thing we have ever discussed on the show. Today, we are making invisible things visible for people who don't visualize when they are asked to imagine things. I am talking to Tom Ebayer, founder of the Aphantasia Network. Tom is an entrepreneur and a business strategist with a passion for building companies. I have lots of questions for him because over the past two years, I have quite the cohort of clients who have aphantasia. Now that I have been asking the questions, no one has ever asked them before. And I have Tom and the good old CBC for that. Tommy Bayer was among the first 21 reported cases of congenital aphantasia mentioned in the original scientific paper by Dr. Adam Zeman in 2015. At the time, there were no resources or support for aphantasia. Tom founded the Aphantasia Network, a social purpose organization dedicated to improving the lives of people with aphantasia through research, advocacy, and support to unleash the power of image-free thinking. His story has been featured in the New York Times, CBC, and the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much, Tom, for making the time to meet with me to talk about this, which I'm so fascinated by. Thank you for having me and for uh, you know extending the conversation to your audience here. So excited to chat more about it. Right. Um, so you know, I I know you have shared your story before. I won't necessarily make you like regurgitate the whole thing, but um, you were you figured out you had aphantasia late in life. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, earlier than some and, and later than others. So I was in, uh, I was in university when I discovered that other people around me visualized most of my life. I didn't, you know, when people would say, Oh, imagine this or picture that I always kind of took it for like a metaphor or a figure of speech. Um, right. and then it was in university when I realized that, no, this is something that, you know, you mean literally picture it. Um, right. you know, I, I had come home from a party, with my girlfriend from the time who, you know, we had seen a mutual friend that we hadn't seen in like a year. And she told me, she's like, Oh, you know, Joanne was wearing the same thing she was wearing last year. And I was kind of taken back by the statement. I was like, how do you remember what she was wearing last year? And it's just something I would not, you know, be, be able to do. And she said, she's like, Oh, you know, I just see the picture in my mind. And it was that statement that just really changed everything for me. I became so curious and so obsessed with this idea that people could see pictures in their mind because, you know, it was just, it was a foreign concept. No kidding. It is, it is funny. So the, the quality that you just mentioned, like, it's like one statement that kind of catches your attention and suddenly that means something. So when I'm with clients and we're talking about something happening in the future and they'll say something that informs me in that moment, I should actually ask, right? Like there's a couple of cues that have started to come up for me as a therapist. And then my question is, so, you know, I'll, when, when just now you kind of had this look that crossed your face when we were talking about imagining yourself in a future scenario, which a lot of therapeutic modalities use visualization, almost all of, all of them do, right? To some extent. And they'll, they'll say, so somebody who doesn't have aphantasia will just quickly answer right away. Somebody who has some extent of aphantasia will be like, well, what do you mean picture it? And as soon as they say that, I'm like, what do you mean? What do I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm like, bingo, here we go. And it's most incredible because one thing you said to me, you know, I've had aphantasia my whole life. So I don't like what it's not like it's a big You've, you've actually been quite successful. It's not something that's held you back in any kind of way work-wise. So is it really a problem? And, and it's just this piece of like connecting and communicating with people. We just all assume everyone has the same thing in their head that every, that we have. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, it's one of the reasons why, you know, we hear from, from folks who are much later in their life, like retirees who are just now discovering they went their whole life not knowing that other people were actually visualizing. So, you know, it's, it's because we don't talk uh, about these things 
maybe so openly that you know you can you can just not know what goes on in someone else's mind mm -hmm. is it you know and, and then there is the point there about uh you know is it a negative a detriment things like that it's it's you know there are the odd cases of acquired aphantasia where someone ha you know can visualize and something happens and they lose the ability to, right. you know, to picture things and i could see that being more of a challenge because it's you maybe haven't learned to adapt or, you know, yeah. you, you know what the other side of the coin is, so to say, yeah. but it's like you've lost something, but if you never, yeah, exactly. To begin with, then exactly. It's like, I, if you never told me, if I never knew that other people were visualizing, like, you know, it's like you, wow. nothing would have changed in the first place. So, um, you kind of learn the strategies and stuff to adapt. So, um, yeah. Well, let me ask you this. So once you, I mean, it's been several years now and you've had time to understand it at a depth, you know, I mean, you're the, the level of knowledge you have is far beyond anybody else who's just figuring it out or scratching the surface. Now, what difference has it made for you in your relationships or in your work now that you know what you know? Yeah, there is, um, there, there are quite a few uh, differences. I mean, I'm going to put the, the, the asterisks in like, I'm coming from the non-visualizer perspective. So right. I, you know, I haven't experienced imagery. What I've come to understand some of the differences is like, you know, there's, uh, I, I look back and connect the dots. You know, if I look back and when I was in school and I don't know, Christine, if you ever like highlighted things in your notebook or, yes. you know, in the textbook. Loves and you highlighting. Go back and, yeah. Well, mostly I've learned like, you know, people highlight things because then they're writing the test and they're visualizing those things that they highlight. So there are like tangible, tactical kind of strategies and things that now I'm like, this is why those things never worked or didn't make sense for me at the time. Things like, uh, you know, and not all a fans are like this, but, you know, I was never a big fan of fiction because mm. I'm not imagining the story as I'm reading it. You know, mm. I'm, I'm you know, conceptually following what's going on, but I get, you know, quite bored if there is lots of detail about, you know, imagining what the scene will look like. It's all seems like mm -hmm. filler to me. So there are sort of some things like that. Um, you know, relationships are an interesting one. Um, I, the way I describe sort of my, my past and how I think about, you know, my, my memories and, and people that I know and, it's sort of like a series of trivia. It's like, I know facts about my past. I know things that have happened. Um, you know, I can tell you lots of characteristics about these things and about people, but I don't have the like mental time travel that is associated with like imagination. So if I, you know, were to think about a happy memory with a friend, like, yeah, I could tell you what we did and I can tell you lots of facts about that thing, but it's different in that I'm not, I can't put myself back there like someone else might. Um, wow. And that goes for positive and negative, right? So there's some, you know, like, okay, if it was a, a really happy memory, maybe you can yeah. feel a of sadness, like you're missing something because I can't relive that. Yeah. But if it was a ne really negative memory, in a way, I'm happy that I can't you no know, re-experience those, those, uh, those negative things. So there's pros and cons to that, that aspect. I I, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. One thing. Okay. So two, two things I made a note. So I remember to come back to it. I want to come back to, um, what you just talked about in terms of grief, um, in a second, but the, the first thing I want to ask. So one thing that as a, so as someone who like, you know, I have an undergrad in psych and a, a master's degree in therapeutic stuff. Right. So I have, I'm not a neuroscientist though. Right. So the nitty gritty of the difference between a memory and an, and, a, and an image in your mind is something that I'm, you can, we can get into the weeds of discovering the difference because a lot of people that I've discovered can, can pull up a memory of something they've already experienced. But the thing is, is they can't conjure a new image of something they've never seen before in the future. Is that mm -hmm. accurate from your point of view? Um, there are, you know, sort of varying degrees. So there's very likely people who who fall into that category who can, uh, you know, visualize their their past but have a difficult time creating images of the future. Mm -hmm. For me, um, I just have no images of anything. So past, future, uh, sort of. There's, mm -hmm. there's sort of no imagery at all. Mm -hmm. There is um, actually, you know, it's a. I actually just been coming off a conversation with Doctor. 
uh, Brian Levine, who's actually out of uh, Rotman there in Toronto, who studies autobiographical memory. Okay. Uh, so anyone interested in the topic, there's there's uh, some some great content uh, you can see on our YouTube with with uh, with Dr. Brian Levine, and he basically says, you know, that the the people are not, you know. There's this idea of photographic memory that yeah. you know people are just like re you know they're just seeing what they saw in the past and that's not really ha what's happening. People okay. are like imagining their memories. They're like creating images in their mind, but it's like a recreation every time okay. instead of like a just a re. You're not. Um, it's not like a slideshow or like a movie that you're replaying uh, like you kind of would on a computer or something like this. So there is that imagery creation is involved in in memory um okay that makes um sense. it does make sense to me now that you know i've talked to enough people about it um one interesting like a blog post i think i read it on a fantasia network where somebody and then it linked me to a youtube video where somebody described that their experience of grief was really different and that they had lost someone that they loved and it seemed to other people like they weren't grieving because they didn't. Um, and what they realized was that they, they didn't have a constant lingering image of this person they lost. They were, it, they were able to move past it and kind of get on with it because they didn't have movies playing in their mind of this person and everything that they had lost. And I don't know, what do you, do you have anything to kind of add to that? I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I, um, you know, I can, I can probably attest to this even personally, you know, I lost my mom when I was uh, quite young. And mm -hmm. not to say that you don't feel the negative emotions and the trauma and the grief at, at the time. But the relationship to it is a little bit different, because for most people, imagery has a largely involuntary component, yep. so meaning, you know, people are seeing pictures in their mind, they're not choosing to see. Oh, and yeah. So, Right. It can be difficult to to move on if your mind is constantly bombarded with images of things right. that Very intrusive. You know, you, it, exactly can be intrusive. There's, there's the whole thing intrusive imagery. And so, yeah. you know, without that intrusive imagery, like the way I, I, I think to wrap this up, I'd have to come back to, you know, the way that I describe how I think mm -hmm. would be, you know, I, I think sort of in monologue and in concepts. So when I'm talking to you, I'm using this voice when, you know, my mouth stops moving, that monologue continues in my mind. Mm -hmm. And so there's that idea that like a like, picture is work. Sorry, can I interrupt you one second? Yeah, please. Like yeah, you're, yeah. you can hear your voice in your mind. Yeah. Now it, I, I wouldn't say that I hear the voice. It's not like I, I'm actually hearing it. I don't have auditory right. imagery either. So if I okay. were to say, you know, um, I don't know if your parent, if you can remember something your parents would say to you when you're young. Oh like, yeah. You, you hear it in their voice. Right. I right. do. So, yeah. So that's the difference. I can remember cognitively, like maybe what the words would be, but I don't okay. hear the sound or quality of their voice. Wow. I just know what it is they've said. So it's my own, <laughs> it's my own thoughts, my own uh, okay. sub vocalization. Right. Um, Got it. That's interesting. Okay. That's actually a really good distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted sure. you because I just wanted to catch that because I know. No, people... that's an important, it is an important distinction. Auditory imagery is one of the ones I think people get confused a lot about. Um, yeah. You know, another interesting one on the auditory is like, you know, if I ask you to think of your favorite song or a song that you like, you can kind of hear the instruments in your mind. Can you hear like. I can hear the music, the lyrics. I can hear the song in the, the band's voice. Like I hear mm -hmm. Eddie Vedder in my head all the time. Yeah, super interesting. So like I could maybe hum to the rhythm of the music, uh -huh. but I don't hear the sound. Uh, you know, wow. it's just. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Now, um, I forget what I was what, what I was saying before, though. Uh, I know I'm just so, you know, I have now I've got like intrusive visual imagery of Pearl Jam. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of intrusive uh, imagery, we'll come back to it. But do people with aphantasia not suffer from OCD or can you have OCD good, and aphantasia? Good question. I mean, and, and this, this maybe loops back, back to the, to the, you know, the trauma and, and getting over things. It's like, yeah, it, it's not that you can't have it. It's just likely experienced in a different, different way. way. And therefore either maybe, 
you could say maybe not as strong or not as frequent, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. Right. Like, like those thoughts that I have that, that, that can, I can still conceptually reminisce or get, you know, go down like conceptual rabbit holes where I'm thinking about, you know, my past or about, you know, my mom after she'd passed actually for mm -hmm. quite a while, I, I think about it a lot. Um, but, but it's just different because, you know, that idea that a picture is worth a thousand words, yeah. you know, well, um, there's this interesting, you know, like relation, like if I had to vocalize a thought, you know, that just yeah. takes time. And so I don't have a lot of, you know, like it just, it's just different because the, 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 there's a different th medium where, where right. thoughts are being expressed. Yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes if you've lost somebody you, you love and gave you a lot of comfort, well, you could, I, I mean, I can imagine that person for me personally, both talking to me and what they would say, like I lost my person who would be the person, you know, my stepdad that I would call for anything, right? Like he was my first phone call, something good, something bad, any of those kinds of things. And not being able to do that has been hard, but I can hear him in my voice, in my head whenever I want. And I can mm -hmm. imagine his presence and I can actually still like smell <laughs> the scent of him and stuff, right? Like all of those things. So they provide great comfort to me. Yeah. Um, but it, so that, that's a really cool thing, I guess, of being hyper fantastic. Um, exactly. So that, that's the pros and cons, you know, there's, yeah. there's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so I, that's one of the things that, you know, I think is, yeah, you know, it would, <laughs> I, 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 I understand and sympathize with the, the, the aphantasics who, who, you know, feel like they are missing something because of that. that right. piece exactly. Yeah. I, I went down the rabbit hole a bit with the Dawes paper and reading about PTSD and wondering whether it was protective to have aphantasia, knowing that like nightmares, for example, are very linked to imagery or emotion processing is very linked to imagery in our brain, like from a cognitive processing point of view. And I think I've experienced because because I, I work in, with trauma a lot that that some of the clients I have that have aphantasia who have PTSD and we're working through different trauma modalities, while there's not a visual component, for example, to the nightmares they have, there's very much a sensation. So they mm -hmm. feel, they smell, they hear all of the negative experiences. So their nightmares are actually more like a flashback. Like they are re-experiencing stuff at night and when they wake up, it all fades away pretty quickly, but it's mm -hmm. like every night it's re-experiencing that stuff. And so my hypothesis <laughs> is that I actually emailed uh, Professor Pearson. He probably thinks I'm this nut from Canada. Um, he has not <laughs> written back to me. So if, if he ever catches wind of this, like, I'm not crazy, I promise. <laughs> but I'm like, so I have, I'm not a researcher. I'm like, I have this hypothesis that I think, you know, when you, there's that idea when you lose one sense, all your other senses heighten and strengthen. And so if, if they're not totally fantastic, but they have a stronger sense of feel and taste and touch, if you've gone through trauma, that might actually be what's harder to address a symptom yeah, like I think that. It, so I don't yeah, think it's protective necessarily. If you're a complete aphantasic, maybe, but anyone that's on the spectrum and can still experience all their other senses a bit, it's almost like, ooh. It's really hard. Yeah. See, the other senses are, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, a fair working hypothesis. You know, if, if <laughs> you, you see this, this work in, you know, in, in sort of other aspects of human life, right. Where one thing is yeah. maybe weakened, but something else is, is strengthened to compensate. Mm -hmm. Even, even with the full AFAN, like me, it's like, yeah, maybe I don't have imagery, but there's likely other things, um, you know, that, that, that are compensating for that, you know, lack of imagery. Cause like we said before, like, you know, aphantasics, you know, can be successful. I've personally talked to, you know, Nobel prize winners who, who don't have, you know, any images. Yeah. So oh, totally. There is, uh, well, right? look at so, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. So there, 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 there is, there is, uh, is it, you know, the brain is super fascinating and finds mm. ways to, um, you know, to, to compensate and, and there are, you know, advantages and in, in differences as well. So right. that's, uh, you know, some, some of the message that I try and, you know, cause when I first discovered aphantasia, I was definitely not of that mindset. I was definitely on the, like, oh, I'm missing something. It's right. you know, a little unfair that, 
you know, yeah. you know, you, 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 you can reimagine your person and yeah. have them there with you. And, you know, yeah, there was, there was definitely times where I felt maybe a little cheated that, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, other people could do that and I couldn't, but, mm-hmm. you know, um, uh, you know, I, I don't see it that way anymore. You know, I think that there are, there are uh, yeah. real advantages to, to image free thinking, um, well, I'm, I mean, as a hyperphantasic, I'm kind of jealous of anybody that isn't haunted by bad visual memories. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's right? one of the big ones. Exactly. It's freedom. Like how freeing must that must be? You're free to just go through life and not be held yeah. back by like bad memories or pictures of the past, right? Exactly. There's, there's one know. conversation that, that always sticks out to me. I, I was speaking with a sports psychologist who mm-hmm. basically told me of a uh, of a, a professional runner that they worked with mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, tripped one time during a race. And mm-hmm. then every time they went up to race, they just couldn't get the picture of them falling out of their mind. Yeah. And it really like, you know, was really like one of those things up. that, that kind of held them back because they were, they, they just couldn't get those pictures out of their mind. And that idea of seeing pictures that you don't want to see, was really one of the things that yeah. started to change my mindset about it. Um, totally I think it's similar journey when you first find out you have ADHD is that Pete there's a grieving process and people are often quite devastated and coded as something that's really wrong with them and they're defective and you can stay in that space but you know we work to help people not be stuck there because there is really a lot of joy beyond that it's nice to be able to work your way through all that stuff so that you can kind of move forward and figure out what it means to you but sports psychology is interesting because there's so much visualization you know, NLP, yeah. I imagine the NLP people are just like, what? Like, cause you have to picture the whole desired state and move forward. Right. So exactly. there must be good, interesting workarounds for sports psychologists. I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. It's this is still in, in, in sort of the, in the early days, but like mm-hmm. um, sports, especially motor imagery. So being able to imagine your move, the movement of your body right. is, you know, one of them, like I would say like visuals, probably the most well researched mm-hmm. and discussed motor is probably the next because of the sports angle. Right. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. So the sensation of feeling your body doing what you need it to do in that moment, the puck is coming at you. Exactly. So you, so, you know, you hear stories of, you know, people who like imagine, you know, throwing the, you know, putting, throwing the ball or throwing the the basketball, you know, from the three point line, just doing it all totally in their mind, you know, so they see it, they feel like what their body would be like moving. Um, so, so yeah, uh, motor imagery is, is a distinct sense different from mm-hmm. like tactile, which is the sensation of touch. Mm-hmm. So if you can feel like, you know, rubbing your hand across like a brick wall, can you imagine yes, like, I can. what that feels right like? now? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's a different and distinct imagery sense. Uh, okay, you know, another that's one, really cool. another one I don't have, uh, but, but an interesting one. And wow. so, so people, you know, you know, per, what some of the work we're interested in doing is really, um, not only being able to quantify these differences in all the different imagery senses and then right. helping to figure out, okay, like, what does this actually mean for, you know, our life, our work and our well being? Yep. So, you know, does it, you know, maybe someone who doesn't have visual imagery, but might have very strong tactile imagery, you know, or vice versa. Do, how do these type of things impact, um, you know, yeah, yeah, our life? This is a, this is, this is really interesting area of exploration. And most people, you know, are unaware that there are even differences uh, in these modalities. Um, quite a few of the people that I work with that have aphantasia are parents. And so they okay. immediately want to wonder whether their kids also have it. Um, and, and I think the question that's come back is that they can't really, how do I explain to them the difference between a memory and an image? Right. And mm-hmm. are there any, so the VVIQ is really for adults, right? Like, are there any child screeners? Because because wanting to be able to help them with school and the reliance yeah. that school has on imagery, you think would be kind of really important. Yeah, there is there's no um, dedicated assessments for children, though that, you know, uh, maybe that's something that should be done. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'm going to actually throw that back to the team here and see if that's something we can we can yeah. put together. Um, there, but, but very likely, you know, rather than questions, it would be more like a conversation. Um, so there's, uh, you know, there are some, uh, some questions, you know, that, that usually get at it. I'm going to just in the background, I'm going to pull up a, yeah, sure. uh, a little thought experiment and maybe we can go through it here. Oh yes. Um, Do experiments on me. I love that. 
the re the thing that um, triggered me to take the test myself and my husband was I asked him the blade of grass or a tree question. And he looked at me and he said, well, what season is it? I'm like, you have to complicate everything. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, what season yeah. is it? I'm like, I don't know, spring. He's like, well, it makes a difference. And then he started describing this spectrum of shades of green. I'm like, you need to take this test. I think you might be on the other side of the scale. And sure <laughs> enough, he was. And he has an incredibly heightened palate. Like he could have been a sommelier. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't taste the things to the extent that he does. So he's a really interesting uh, guy. Um, so then I'm like, wait a minute because we talk about having adventure dreams all the time. So then I'm like, I better take this thing too. And so I did. And I was like, wow, it's just wild. Mm. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that, uh, you know, like, like going back to that, that piece that you don't know what's going on in someone else's mind. And, oh and, yeah. We've been married know, for that, One years. of the very cool things about <laughs> Ephantasia is that, you know, even if, you know, you do picture things, you know, like you do, Christina, it opens up a conversation. It opens up this metacognition Get to know that, uh, you know, yeah. is, is, is a really, is really interesting. I I did find the, okay. the experiment here. So, cool. so let's do this. So okay. this is um, called the ball on the table visualization experiment. So okay. try this, visualize, picture, imagine, whatever you want to call it, a ball on a table. Mm -hmm. Now imagine someone walks up to the table and gives the ball a push. What happens to the ball? Okay. Did you, you got that? Yeah. So now answer these questions. Okay. What color was the ball? Orange. What gender was the person that pushed the ball? Boy. What did they look like? Um, well, I didn't picture a face at first, but I've got a face now. Okay. What size was the ball? What about the table? What shape was it? So there's a few of these questions. So, you know, a really good way, like a Fantasia test, if you don't want to like do the VVIQ is yeah. you, when I asked you that original scenario to visualize the ball on the table, yeah. you know, lots of these characteristics or the color of the ball and stuff mm -hmm. were inherently in the scene. Yes. Whereas opposed to someone with aphantasia might be like, okay, I'm answering those questions now. I never, there was, the ball had no color. You know, the person didn't have a gender, you know, the si oh. the ball didn't have a size oh. until you asked me those questions that now I can pick one for it. Yeah. But really they were all concepts. So it's like conversations like this, I think are a way to get at Interesting. To some, yeah. does, you know, do I really have aphantasia or not? Does so what did you think at first versus when you had to answer a question? So for me, it's like, okay, it's the concept. So I'm, okay, there's a ball on a table. Somebody pushed it off. Okay, the ball falls off the table. Right. But there's no characteristics of Details. the ball. There's no yeah. characteristics of the table. You know, those are, are, because there's no image associated with this concept, you know, the, yeah. the image is what brings to all those characteristics is how they're experienced. Right. Right. And so, you know, when you ask the questions, I can say, okay, I know what colors, you know, a ball could be. I know. You, you just know pick what, one. Uh, I right. just pick one. Yeah. They didn't have any of those attributes already. Already. Yeah. That's exactly. wild. You're teaching me so much. I mean, I think this is so interesting and I just feel like there has to be so many interesting implications therapeutically too, right? Um, for sure. There's for so sure. there's so many places to slow down and to and to just get into other people's experience of the world a little bit more than I mean, dig a little deeper. That's what we do, right? Like I've always wanted to do that intuitively. I'm so fascinated by how other people make sense of their experiences in life. But this just adds a whole other layer of interest to this. There's a, um, a psychiatrist who at one point had been at John Hopkins who put a TikTok up that was mm -hmm. a little, because she's a Fantasic and her partner at the time isn't. And so that's like, a, it was like a, if you, I ask you to picture a red star, which one do you see? And she had six options and you had to pick from like nothing to the bright red star and everything in between, right? And so that was that like a visual thing like that for kids could be interesting because then they can match what they saw to what that that picture was that shows up in the TikTok. And I mean, TikToks are small bites, but when they're from credible people, they're they're so really interesting. Um, yeah, and knowing yeah. that that your kid's brain processes information in a different way than you could provide such a, a context of understanding and I think compassion. Because often sometimes what I hear from parents is that I don't know why they can't 
just do what I want them to do, right? Yeah. If they're they're different neurotypes, um, because the parent hasn't considered yet, I think that a is it developmentally appropriate, but b that they actually are experiencing the world in a completely different way. But that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? no, I think you you hit the nail on the head there. It's like one of the things that this really opens up is in, in a really tangible way because we know about things like personality differences and other types of you know cognitive differences but those yeah. are most of them are, are rather abstract whereas this is quite tangible you know you know if you see pictures or not you know you know if you can hear sounds in your mind or not and yeah. that I think can help build empathy empathy for the fact that you know we we do have these real cognitive differences that Mm -hmm. impact how we perceive the world and those differences yeah will will have implications on thought processes and processing events and memories yeah. and all this type of stuff so amazing um, yeah can you tell us a little bit more about aphantasia network what it does how you started it sure so um, you know, when, so I guess I'll start with how I started it. So yeah. I, you know, when I first discovered that, you know, others were visualizing, there wasn't a word for aphantasia. Um, yeah. you know, so I did a lot of you know, Googling and You're again, I was obsessed. Here. And, it's super cool. <laughs> there was, uh, <laughs> you know, there was, you know, there was a couple of posts like, Oh, you know, just, uh, you know, meditate and you can visualize. So, oh, okay. Man. You know, <laughs> like I tried, but didn't, didn't get very far, obviously. So, yeah. um, you know, when, when, you know, I was lucky enough to, to find Dr. Adam Zeman in the UK and was one of those original 21, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, patients is maybe the wrong word, but people that, that oh, were studied. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, the nature of my story with, you know, I'd recently lost my mom and everything. And so that was the story he used, uh, you know, mm -hmm. part of the publication. And mm -hmm. I did an interview with the New York Times and, that interview just had, I had people from all over the world start emailing me and wow. reaching out on LinkedIn and stuff, like asking questions saying, you know, I have aphantasia too. Like, what does this mean? Wow. And so, um, so, so really that, that was kind of the motivation to, for, for getting the network started because, okay. you know, I think uh, reflecting back on that time when I first discovered we need a place where um, you can come to learn more about what this is, what it means for your life, you know, like the assessment, the VVIQ, people can take it to kind of get a sense of, you know, uh, whether or not they have it or where they fall on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and this is actually one of the, you know, it's still aphantasia is still in the top like 5% of new research interest, according to a site called Altmetric, which measures cool. the popularity of different research papers. So wow. there's also lots of new research going on. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's sort of this phenomenon in science in general, where great research gets done and sits in papers and never yeah. kind of makes it way to the public. And so mm -hmm. we're also able to act as this sort of bridge where, you know, we can disseminate some of the, you know, latest findings so people can make sense of what this means for their life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's totally, you know, uh, just, a, you know, we're, we're not like publicly funded or there's no grant money or anything like yeah. that. So everything is, you know, so we do, we do have a membership aspect of the community for yep. people who are interested in it and, you know, uh, want to learn more and be connected with other, you know, like minds. Mm -hmm. uh, in yeah. Um, you know, so, so then we have like, we run a private discord community and okay. host AMAs and stuff with different researchers and things like this to hmm. try and, and help people better understand what it means, you know, you know to live a life with aphantasia. That's amazing. Um, is there anything that I'll make sure that I obviously I'm going to link the network and maybe a couple of videos because I've seen some of them because you guys they're posted on YouTube, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. I've seen some of them. Um, they're excellent. And are there, you know, are there any like specific areas of research that are happening now that are particularly um, that you're particularly interested in? Yeah, there's a there's quite a few areas that, that that I'm very interested in. So one of the one of the big ones is um, that relationship to memory. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of interesting work going on around, you know, imagery and memory and, and what the relationships are. Uh, specifically around autobiographical memory it seems to be one of the areas that aphantasia impacts the most. Mm -hmm. um, Can you explain? A, yeah, autobiographical memory is memory of you know of your own life. So it's different mm -hmm. than um, like uh, um, 
semantic or like conceptual type of memory. Uh, so memory for like facts and ideas. This is memory for your own um, like events that have happened in your life. And okay. so there, there does seem to be a, a, at least a correlation between uh, aphantasia and um, lower autobiographical memory, but that just in the context of like being able to relive your events, which is um, intuitive as you come to understand aphantasia, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there's some really interesting work going on around objective identification of aphantasia. So there is, there is some early indicators that there's a relationship between your physiology and mm -hmm. your mental imagery. So by that, I mean, if we were, you know, Christina, if you and I were to both read, let's say a scary passage from like a, I don't know, a John King novel or something, mm -hmm. um, we could actually detect the difference because you, you know, your hair might stand up a little right. more, you might, you might get a little more clammy because yeah. you're, you're actually picturing the, you know, the story yeah. in your mind. So there are different, you know, there, there's, this is just one of a few different relationships between imagery and physiology. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the areas to sort of push uh, increase, let's say, the legitimacy in the research that gets done into aphantasia is a more objective uh, identification technique. Yeah, physiological markers. I saw there was a research into biomarkers. Yeah, exactly. There is some interesting research going on on, on, on different biomarkers, genetics, things like this mm -hmm. that might uh, might prove fruitful. And then personally, one of the big areas that, that we're, we're, we're very interested in and very involved in is in the multi-sensory aspect of it. So much of the conversation has really been around visual imagery, but mm -hmm. um, you know, aphantasia can be experienced in any of the modalities. Uh, there are people, for example, with visual imagery, but don't imagine sound or don't imagine mm -hmm. smell and taste, which is probably the most common uh, variation. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, we've actually for 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 anyone who might be interested, we also have a little assessment called Imagination Spectrum okay. that uh, where where you can take an assessment that we've designed with some okay. psychometrics folks uh, to sort of see where you where what your overall imagery profile might look like. That okay. VVIQ we spoke about is just for visual. Okay. Um, and so so this multisensory imagery profile, uh, and then and then as new research comes out, trying to link that that profile to, um, you know, different, different impacts in your life, work and well-being. So, you know, what might it mean for you? Sort of like a, 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 we're, we're, you know, in air quotes, imagining it as a um, sort of like a, the next generation of like a personality assessment, right. uh, but really tied to your imagery profile. I think this is, a, yeah, it gives people a new language and a way to, to increase that metacognition that, yeah, um, to think, think about really yeah how we all process differently and how that impacts our experience in the world and all of those things, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. Is the imagination spectrum available for people to take on the site as well? Yeah, so there's a link from aphantasia.com uh, okay. under assessment. It'll say imagination spectrum, or you can Wait. just go imaginationspectrum.com. It's a different domain, and okay. uh, people can take it there as well. So, yeah. We'll definitely check that out. That's really, really neat. Um, anything you would like to say to anybody, my, all of my clients really, who have just discovered in the last several months that they have aphantasia? Um, the, the, what, you know, the, the thing that, that I'll say is that um, I, the way I've come to, to see it is, is it really can be a potential strength you know, I, I, my personal belief is that, you know, your beliefs can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so if you look for all the things that you can't do, you know, you will find them. But if you look for the, mm -hmm. the things that are advantages, you'll find those as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be really powerful and empowering. Um, and imagery is, you know, uh, can be a double-edged sword, that piece around right. involuntary imagery and, and all the potential negative you know, side of things. Uh, that leads me to say like, you know, if someone were to add, you know, offer me a pill to, to, you know, change it or cure it in air quotes, you know, I probably wouldn't take it. Mm. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, uh, you know, your listeners might come to a, a similar realization. I can't even imagine how overwhelming that would be. Probably wouldn't be able to oh, wow, would, like yeah. all of a sudden, right? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. It would seem, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I mean, one last thing I'd like to ask you about. There's something that, that a word you use a lot that I don't think I've, I've ever really 
used a lot, but all my aphantasics say it a lot, which is conceptually. So when I, mm. when I'm trying to understand like what their experience of something is, and, and even, I guess, you know, on a human way, match it to mine, like I'm comparing and contrasting to try and understand it deeper. They'll always say, well, conceptually, or I get the concept, or I, I feel the concept of that. And I'm just like, what does that even mean? Like in real terms, like I know what the word means, but it's just like, I want to crawl into this experience of knowing of what it feels like to conceptually experience something rather than just picturing it. And I guess I can't because I can't turn this thing off. That's like this movie projector in my <laughs> brain that just goes all the time. I'm used to it. That's um, a, that's a, it's a really good point. It's like that, that I, you know, just like, I don't know what it's like to picture things Yeah. You know, for most visualizers. They can't know what it's like to not right. picture things because you're picturing what it's like to not that's picture. Right. <laughs> it's <laughs> right. so, so interesting. So it's a, you can't be done. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Like one last question. <laughs> so <laughs> sure, sure. I, I think all the or original research I read was saying that like, this is really rare. It's like 1.5% of the population. And there's been updates to say it's up to 5% of the population. And my cohort is a skewed sample because we have such a huge neurodivergent population to begin with. So it clearly must be more present in people who are already neurodivergent, but you don't have to have another neurodivergence. Like, I think you can just have aphantasia and not have ADHD or autism or anything like that. So is there any idea of just how widespread or what it, the overlap is with other? I said, I wouldn't ask you for numbers, but that's, that's, that's okay. The yeah, there is, um, <laughs> you know, the, there, there's such, wide ranging stats from different studies right. based on yeah. you know different methodologies and things like this and I, you know so ranges are honestly anywhere from like you know like point like half a percent for full aphantasia mm -hmm. you know to yeah we've seen up to as high as five percent you know for visual aphantasia it all depends on the sampling methodology Right. It's all biased by really know yet, you know, the type right. of people who fill out surveys online, you know, whereas this is like, really, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, something that can obviously affect humans all over the world and all different backgrounds and yeah. conditions. And, and it uh, is, gen there is a genetic or hereditary component to it, we think. Could be, could yeah. be. Okay, we're not sure yet. Okay. Yeah, it could okay. be. <laughs> okay. Very likely, it's not like a, you know, it's this one gene that that, that displays it. It could be that there is, you know, a, a couple of different, you know, uh, patterns okay. maybe that, that could be found. This is just, mm -hmm. I'm not a genetics guy, but this is just yeah, you know, yeah. some of the conversations I've had. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so interesting wow. to see what how that all unfolds. Super neat. Um, thank you so much for being here this morning. This is one of the most fascinating conversations I've had. So I really, really uh, value that and value your time. I'll link all these resources in the show notes. Um, and everyone who's interested in this can can find their way in and dig in to, to listen and learn and figure this all out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. It was a great conversation. And uh... Hope to talk to you again soon. Cool. Stop this. Oh, let's stop video. Okay. Oh, wrong one. Where's my button?